Everyone, how's it going? We're gonna do a song examination today because Leanne, or Faithful Defender, shared the song on her Facebook, and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. And I clicked it and looked at it, and I was like, oh, that could be a good one. And so here we are. Uh, for those of you who are new to the page, we this started off with a Q&A. Someone asked me about a song, and I examined it, and I, um, I, I was asked in a Q&A what I thought about the song. And I was like, well, this isn't a worship song. It's a testimony song. So I made that distinction. And then I kind of broke down why I didn't like the song. And so that turned into this. And so over time, I analyzed some songs and I came up with this template to make it objective, which, by the way, the objectivity is uh, what makes some people not like the way I set it up because it's almost too gracious. It always gets a solid grade, um, even if it's by someone who may be a false teacher, if it fits the objective bill. And so that's kind of what it's all about, though. It's about uh, critically thinking through songs. It's about seeing the difference between a testimony song and a worship song. And so this template and this template are both up on the website, and I'll talk about them as we get to it. I don't think I have anything else. So this is the song we're looking at today, um, I Need a Ghost Song Examination. Now, since I know who it's by, it's by Bethel Music or uh, Brandon Lake, and since I know who it's by, that does affect... Um, how I view the song. And so I'll tell you what I think about it objectively as we go through. And then I will also share what I think the implications are whenever you think about who it's from. Um, because who the song comes from does matter to me. That's my conviction. Um, and I have a whole video on that if you want to go check that out. Um, it's on my IGTV and YouTube called uh, you know, something about the music of heretics or something like that. So, um, which by the way, if you're new here and you don't know anything about Bethel, um, I mean, a bunch of people talked about Doreen Virtue, Cultish had a whole series on them, uh, Leanne, Faithful Defender, uh, you have, uh, this is so many, Katie, the uh, Brian Millennial, and it just kind of goes on and on, but you can go on my website, click the Bethel category and look it up where I did an episode with Mike Clark from the Bethel Church and Christianity page and all that. So there's um, plenty of resources on that. This part we will discuss at the end, um, and I think it's important for um, just to kind of get a real well-rounded view and how I view his comment after the fact. So looking at the lyrics, um, I don't need smoke or mirrors because I know there's a God who is real. I don't need the lights to fool me because I have seen the God who heals. Um, whoa. So I agree with, with this objectively. Objectively, I'm all for this, right? We don't need smoke or mirrors. Uh, we don't need lights to fool us. We don't need pragmatism. Just give us God. Give us gospel. Give us scripture. You know, give us the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Because we know there's a God who's real, and there's a God who does heal. Um, and so, yeah, I'm all for that. Uh, in fact, I would I would say these things, though. Um, this right here can be interpreted in different ways. And that, again, comes to where it's coming from. So we need to look at what they mean by healing, uh, because in most cases within Bethel theology, it doesn't mean what orthodoxy necessarily means. It means it's God's will, will to always heal, period. And I think that, that kind of shows up later in the song. But the biggest thing about this being from uh, Bethel here is this irony. And, you know, I, I want to say that the artist, um, the artist Brandon Lake, he's really got a great sound. I want to throw that out there. I'm, as a musician, I can appreciate his sound. I think it's a great sound. But, you know, musicians who are playing Christian music or writing Christian songs need to be the theologians first and then musicians second. You know, that should be the way because you're putting words into Christians' minds and in their mouths and eventually, because of the repetition, into their hearts, right? That's how we get things into our hearts. We chew on them. We think on them. Uh, and that's what the music is for, right? That's why Caleb's always like positive, empowering Caleb, because you're singing these songs. You're kind of doing this positive affirmation thing, right? So that's the point. That's the purpose. And so that's something that we need to consider here that if we're putting things into people's lips, uh, thoughts and hearts, they need to be sound. Right. But the thing about Bethel here is this. I find this to be so ironic because this is what Bethel operates out of all the time. If you look up a Bethel video up, uh, Bethel music video up um, on YouTube, what you see is lighting atmosphere you know you see the stage being set you see tones being used in the music you see elements being thrown in to evoke responses and experiences that's what it's about it's about it's it's all about that and so this is wholly ironic um especially with the smoke and mirrors we don't need the smoke and mirrors we have a god who's real but we'll put glitter in our ventilation system right i mean come on it's just 
there's a lot of irony with that. And it kind of irks me uh, because I see this song as a smoke and mirror for what Bethel is producing, what they're saying. It's like, no, no, we don't need that. We have the real thing. We don't need that. It's, I know it's not. I'm saying that right now. I know it's not, but it feels like damage control in some sense of all the criticism they've had over the last few years whenever they've been kind of shown to be who they are, right? Um, I know I ask when I'll receive it because you're not a God who withholds. I hear you say, just believe me. Okay, um, objectively, there's nothing wrong here if we're talking about the right things. I'll receive it. Receive what? What are we praying for, right? Um, because you're not the God who withholds. Withholds what? Are we talking about his will or things that we want from, from our fleshly desire? Are we, what are we talking about here? I hear you say you just believe me. Yes, there's an element of faith that needs to be recognized when we pray. If you pray without faith, what's the point, right? James talks about that. Um, and so this kind of goes back into who it's from and what we're talking about here. Um, this right here, I know when I ask, I'll receive it, is referring to the Holy Spirit, and that comes in the next section. Right here, this bothers me. The Holy Spirit is not an it. And Christians, we need to stop calling the Holy Spirit an it. He is a person. He is the third person of the triune Godhead. Um, he, he is not an it. Um, but that's what he's talking about. I know when I ask, I'll receive it, the Holy Spirit, because you're not a God who withholds. Now, we're talking about withholding the Holy Spirit. Yeah, uh, God does give his Holy Spirit to the believer, right? Um, but... Whenever we're talking about withholding, what often is meant through this theological lens is, of course, withholding uh, healing, right? Uh, the God who heals, he doesn't withhold. I'll receive it because he because he doesn't withhold, right? Um, so if he's talking about healing in the previous verse, then that's also not true. Job, though you slay me, I will still praise you. Timothy, take wine for your frequent ailments. Right? He didn't heal him. Paul, I have this thorn in my side that God has not removed. Sometimes he does withhold, and it's for a purpose. And there's a bigger theology. There's more glory in that. When we are weak, he is strong. We don't need to always be physically comfortable on earth for God to have glory, uh, for God to be you know, magnificent. God is, first off, gloried or honored because of who he is you know, inherently. So, regardless. Uh, this, there's nothing wrong with that objectively, I don't think. So, this is this is what breaks the song. Okay, you can talk about all the other stuff. I don't care what you read into, what you read out of it. This is what breaks it. Um, I need a Holy Ghost. I need a Holy Ghost. I need a Holy Ghost. I need a Ghost. And he repeats it again. I need a Ghost. No. I don't like it. First off, um, you don't... It, it's, it's so ambiguous... I need a Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter which one. Just give me a Holy Ghost, right? Um, you don't say, I need a God. I need a God. I need a God. Or I need a Jesus. I need a Jesus. I need a Jesus. No. You say, I need Jesus. I need God the Father. I need the Holy Spirit. This is irreverent. Um, and I think it's just, I think about like the different versions of um, Holy spirits and other religions. One example is Hinduism. We talk about Hinduism where they have millions of God, uh, millions of gods. And if you don't know, they have a version of Jesus and they have a version of the Trinity, which has its, uh, counterfeit Holy spirit. Uh, and that's when you can get into the discussion of the Kundalini. We're not going to get there, but they have that. Which Holy ghost are you asking for? Are you asking for one that just does what you want it to do? And I want to say it because he used that term. No, we don't need a Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. You don't need a Jesus. You need the Jesus. You don't need a God. You need the one true God. That just, it really irks me. It just does. Um, and his comment that was shown in the beginning does come into play in that later on. We'll talk about that here in a second. <sighs> Sorry, that kind of fires me up. Uh, so I need a Holy Ghost to awaken my soul. Awaken is a buzzword. Um, there's really nothing wrong here, but it's a buzzword for, for that system of thought. Um, so I'll just leave it as it is. I need a love that glows rather than my bones that evidence shows. Now, I don't like this because uh, it's used with this song and rattle to refer to, you know, coming to, to, to be alive, to living, to living life, to the fullest kind of thing, right? Uh, which isn't a wrong which isn't wrong to want, right? We all want to live 
uh, and be abiding and have fruit, right? And, and the, the springs of living water. But the rattling bones is about bringing the dead to life, which in New Testament theology is regeneration. It happens once. It doesn't continuously happen. Once you're alive, you're alive. Um, so there's, um, it's it's the right conclusion with the wrong uh, wrong road. I don't know how to put that. Uh, I need a heart on fire that I'll never grow tired whenever I go. We all want that. Can't argue with that. I want my heart to be on fire all the time too. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't need a counterfeit comfort because uh, nothing in this world remains. Um, so this one I could nitpick a little bit. I think it's fine. I don't need a counterfeit comfort because um, nothing in this world remains. Of course, after this, the course repeats. I need a Holy Ghost. I don't need a counterfeit comfort. I need a Holy Ghost. Couldn't that be a counterfeit comfort if the Holy Ghost is our comforter? Which, by the way, uh, for ghosts, um, I'm okay with ghosts. Some people get kind of weird about that. It's just the way that it was used in the Middle English. You're talking about Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, Tyndale, King James. It was just the way that it was translated. There's nothing wrong with it necessarily. Um so yeah, I mean, we don't need a counterfeit comfort. We need the real comfort because nothing in this world remains. We need hope. We need real lasting hope, right? Nothing wrong with that, though I think that it's a little bit silly to say I don't need a counterfeit comfort, but then it doesn't specify what the true comfort is, the Holy Spirit, who is the comfort, who is the advocate, right? And it's just kind of weird. I need something stronger than lightning. I really don't like that line. And there's nothing really wrong with it because obviously um, God is stronger than lightning. Uh, flowing inside these veins, just standard kind of artistic rhetoric, right? So uh, what are you going to do? Uh, you're the fire. I can't explain it. Again, that's just kind of like a, a buzz phrase, buzz idea, fire, fire. You know, we talk about the, the Holy Spirit came down like fire on Pentecost, right? I don't know why we, we have to liken uh, that image all the time, but that's just kind of what it goes on to. You're the fire. I can't even explain it. If you can't explain it, I... I mean, I don't know. It feels like I'm bursting with heavenly language every time I get a taste. I know I just want more. I just want more. I just want more. So basically, he wants to have more and more of this and this. He wants to have more and more of the experience of God, which in itself is not bad. Where it, come from, where it comes from makes a difference, though, right? Um, we're talking about... Just experiences, experience, experience. We seek after God, not for the experience, but for God, right? The experiences are great. Seeking the presence of God is what we're supposed to do. We seek the presence of God when we go to prayer and scripture, right? But he's not talking about seeking the presence of God. He's just speaking about his experiences. Um, every time I get a taste, I know. I just want more. I just want more. Um, so there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but it's just vague enough to where, okay, you're the kingdom that's been growing inside of me. This one I sent to a couple people because I was curious about what they thought. Um, my initial thought is, no, God is not the kingdom. No, God is establishing his kingdom. God is not the kingdom, and the kingdom is not growing inside you. We are part of the kingdom that he is establishing. So this is just wrong from my book. Uh, it's kind of a weird phrase. So whenever I gave it to a couple people to look at, they were like, I don't really know. because It's kind of bizarre. Um, it's like a lion's roar that wants to revive me. So here the kingdom is a lion's roar that wants to revive me. That's just strange. Um, it's just strange. So it's taking, I don't know, it's taking the work of the Holy Spirit, a revive, which, you know, brings to life, which already occurred. And it kind of conflates ideas in a weird, bizarre way. Every time, every time I get a taste I know I just want more. So this kind of repeats that up here, right? Oh, that's it. That was the bridge. So that's the bridge. Uh, looking at it, anthropology. Now there's an emphasis on need. I need this. I need that. I need you. So I'll give him the need, right? I'll give him anthropology, which by the way, if you're wondering, my check marks are backwards because I'm left-handed. Fun fact of the day. Subject. Who's the subject? It's, it's all about him, his experience, what he wants, what he needs, He's the subject, so he's not getting the subject point. Theology proper, what is said about God? Well, he says that he's a healer. Okay, that, that could be one thing. I'll give him that point. Um, you can call him a healer. You can call him, uh, he, he calls him stronger than lightning. I guess you can say that's, uh, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll give that, I'll give it a 0.5 total. 
person's mentioned. I'm not going to give him that. He didn't mention a specific person. He said God ambiguously. Um, and he said a Holy Ghost, but he didn't mention anything blame. Redemption aspects mentioned. He mentioned revival and he mentioned healing. I'll go ahead and give that to him. I'm not going to give him any bonus for aspects mentioned. Is it Christian exclusive? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think the only thing that almost made it Christian exclusive was I need a holy ghost, right? You take away holy, I need a ghost. What does that even mean, right? <laughs> um, and so I, I don't think it's Christian exclusive. I don't think you really get that. In fact, he does take away holy. Um, he says, I need a ghost. I need a holy, holy, holy. Uh, I need a ghost, which is for the song structure, but he does take away that element at another point, so I'm going to give that to him. Congregational. Is it congregational? No, it's not congregational. It's all about him, I, me, um, which isn't always bad, but this isn't something that, a, you know, it's for a congregation. So I wouldn't say that. Repetition. Um, it's repetition wasn't too bad. Um, whenever I listened to it, uh, the chorus is pretty repetitive, but in terms of verse structure and chorus, I'll go ahead and give it to that. Clarity. I'm not going to give it clarity because I, I don't think it was very clear. So looking at this, we got one, two, three, four, uh, 4, 4.5, which would put it, well, again, I keep getting into these like middle sections that don't exist. It would put it right here in between. We'll give it a C minus. How about that? We'll make up one. Um, I guess the C minus will go underneath the C, wouldn't it? We'll give it a C. We'll give it a C. I don't know. I don't know what to do anymore. Anyway, so that's what I'll give. Is it fair? Uh, I think it's objective enough. I like to think I was kind of gracious on that one, honestly, for a song that I was kind of irked with. Um, so I was biased going in. Let's talk about this. So this is the testimony song, right? Testimony song uh, where it's all about me with a little bit of God tacked on and about what God's doing for me and all this other stuff. Uh, here we have uh, us in light of God. And so this is a worship song. I like to say that this is primarily what you see in the Psalms where the Psalms are talking about us in light of God. It's always about to magnify God. Um, so that's what I see as a worship song. And then there's the songs that are all about God, which is also the Psalms. Um, and so these are the worship songs. These are testimony songs. If I had to categorize this one, it was definitely a testimony song. So should it be used for, um, worship? No, it shouldn't. Um, it's a testimony song. And honestly, because really he could fix the, I need a Holy ghost. All he has to say is I need the Holy ghost. It wouldn't change the way his song is structured. You know, it's, it's one syllable, the, a easy. Uh, he could he could fix that. Why he went that route is kind of bizarre to me. I don't like it. <laughs> I just don't. Um, I, I mean that that's that kind of goes back into the the Bethel theology, where where the Holy Spirit is a force that you are to use and to activate and to direct at God for your will. I don't like it. The Holy Spirit is not your genie. Um, Jen Johnson quote right there. The Holy Spirit to me is like the genie from Aladdin, right? So here's what he said on YouTube. He put up this uh, quote on YouTube. Some context for the song. Uh, I want to say right out the gate that if you have to put this after the fact, where everywhere else that this song appears won't have this context, then the song isn't worth it. You know, I talked about this with Reckless Love. If you want my view on that, I have a highlight on Reckless Love. It says Reckless, question mark. Um, I said, you know, at the end of the day, Corey had to re-explain his song several times. And it still just made it worse. And if it, if it's that questionable, especially in theology, just don't use it. Why use it? Because it sounds good. You can change it. I mean, he could, he could have made that song. Uh, you know, he could have changed what word was used to describe God there. Same as this, instead of a it could be the, he could revise it. He could still revise it. Easy peasy. So some context about the song. This song is about the Holy ghost. Because there's only one Holy Ghost. All right. That fixes my problem, right? But it doesn't. It doesn't fix the problem of the song. Uh, it just doesn't. I I don't know how just publishing a song that's going to go global. And you know it's going to be global. And it's going to be played in churches. We're going to play this song in churches. It's going to go global. You know, Australia is really big on uh, this NAR stuff. And of course, America is flooded with it. It's going to be played everywhere. No one's going to have this. We're going to assume it, sure, maybe, but is it still reverent 
Is it still appropriate? Can we not do better? That's the biggest thing. You know, a lot of the things I've said this before, and I'll say it again, that with Christian music, it's we're writing, we're sitting down, we're writing a song to praise how wonderful God is. 66 books of the Bible to pull inspiration from for a song about how great God is. And this is the best we can do. I don't like it. The song is a personal one written from a place of the past. It's key for me. Uh, meaning I realize something more than the world could offer and that, it's, and that it's the power and the relationship of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying that this song is written from a place in the past. So he wrote it in the past, realizing that he needed something more than the world can offer. So he's either an unbeliever who realizes that he needs something that the world can't offer. So this song is written as an unbeliever, basically to unbelievers, because we know what we need right? I needed something more. It sounds like he still needed to look for something more, right? I need a Holy Ghost. I need something. We know what we need. We need salvation. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Father. We know what we need. That makes this song more about the unbeliever than the believer, okay? Um, now, if he was already saved in the situation, giving you know that whole situation the benefit of the doubt, then this wouldn't be appropriate. So you would have to conclude that on the basis of his own words, that this song was written from an unbeliever's perspective to an unbeliever. Um, but think about it this way. If you're writing a song as the perspective of an unbeliever and you, you wanted to show that there is something more that you need, why wouldn't you use that to direct people to the Holy Ghost immediately? If you recognize that there's only one Holy Ghost... Why not just make the song about that and direct the people who are realizing that they need something more than the world can offer to the Holy Ghost? I don't see any justification in the fact that he had to clarify shows that he knows. Just revise the song. I mean, Brandon, Brandon has a great voice, great style. Again, revise the song. Just do it. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's put out by Bethel. Um, and it's my personal conviction. It's not my job to, you know, force my convictions or my, my positions on you, but it's my conviction that we don't play music from them. You want to find out? I have videos on that. Uh, and that's kind of where I land. So hopefully this was fair. I try to be gracious. Um, I actually did four or five different takes of this. I recorded some of it yesterday and I was like, mm, I'm going to delete that. Um, so I looked at this song multiple times to kind of make sure I wasn't out of line. And, and every time, I couldn't help it. Uh, I just could not help it. Every time I got to this slide, I just couldn't keep my cool. This this just irks me. Um, and so to that, Christian, it's not a Holy Ghost. It is not an it. It's not a thing. It's the third person of the Trinity. He is the comfort. I will send a comfort and he will comfort you. He will teach you things. He will lead you to conviction. He is an advocate who helps you cry out, Abba, Father. Reverence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You can grieve him. Don't grieve him. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. It's a person. It's not an A. It's not an it. It's not a thing. And there's only one. There's only one. That's it. God bless you all. <laughs> Have a great day.